Hello there, and a very warm welcome to the latest in the fourth series of the World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar series. Um, you're kindly joining us by Zoom. Great that you are, but you're registered and you'll be able to take part in the poll that we've got coming up shortly. And we're just going to mark time very shortly uh, for those who've been with us before. You know, we'll just wait till we get the Facebook live audience with us as well. And then we'll get started on the, this evening's webinar, which is around uh, aggression in horses. Um, and a very warm welcome to those joining us on Facebook Live for the latest World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar series. This is our fourth series we've been going since 2020 and all of our previous webinars that we've been running, I think we're almost up to 50 on our YouTube channel, our YouTube education channel, and we'll put a sign up to that so you can register and link up to that. Um, and tonight I'm delighted that we've got Renata Larson and Claire Dickey who are going to be talking to us around aggression in horses and most importantly how we can recognize it and what we can do about it um for those of you who have joined us before you know that the, the format for this evening is renata is going to give us a presentation for about 25 minutes then we're going to go into a short structured q a and then the floor is very much open to all of you to ask your questions if you're joining us on facebook live then please put your uh, questions in the comments section if you're joining us on zoom then please use the Q&A function. By all means, chat amongst yourselves using the chat function. But if you've got a question, please do put it in the Q&A uh, tab because it makes it my, my job so much easier. You can also upvote questions uh, when they're in the Q&A tab on Zoom. As I mentioned, um, all of our previous YouTube um, Wednesday webinars are up on our YouTube edu edu uh, education channel. And the success of all of our webinars is very much down to this being a two-way conversation. So do please get involved when it comes to the Q&A session. So um, before I introduce Renata first, I'm going to ask a, a, quick, a quick poll question. So I'm, I'm, but to do that, I've got to share my screen. Uh, so there we go. So understanding aggression in horses, um, that's what we're here to do today. Um, how often do you observe aggression in horses? And the, the poll options there are frequently, sometimes, never, or I'm not sure how to recognize it. So if you could just have a quick, um, if you're on the Zoom, you'll be able to use that, do the poll. If you're on Facebook Live, I'm afraid you can't do the poll. So please do next time, do register for the, the Zoom uh, for our Wednesday webinars and you'll be able to take part in the poll. So whilst you're doing that, I'm going to introduce you to Renata, who is part of uh, the World Horse Welfare team as part of our public affairs in education and research. It's great to have her with us today. Uh, she's an, uh, a specialist in ethology, um, in behaviour. Um, and she, um, as you can see here, she runs her own platform, which aims to take the, the latest behavioural research and make it accessible to owners. And that's such an important part of everything we do with our horses, being able to sort of find out what the latest research is, some of which is quite scientific, and really be able to digest that as individual horse owners. So really look forward to seeing Renata. One of the things you might not know about Renata is about when she was 10, she was kicked out of the choir because she was deemed to be such an awful singer. I don't think they do that in school anymore. But um, a few years later, she went on to win the school karaoke, karaoke competition uh, with the R Ramstein's Du Hast song. I don't know if you know that. Doesn't have many lyrics, I noticed that song, but she still won it, which just shows to show that if you, you could turn any weakness into a strength, if you try it, if you try hard. So um, that's brilliant. And I'm delighted that Renata is joining us. Before I hand the floor over to Renata, um, I'm going to ask Basil if he could give us the answer or the, the response to the poll. So there you go. Um, the vast majority of people, well, you know, all bar 5% uh, uh, often see aggression or sometimes uh, see aggression in their horses. So you've very much come to, to the right place. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to uh, Renata. Stop showing my screen. And Renata, over to you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Roly. And thank you to everyone who is uh, here today and is equally interested in this fascinating topic. So first hurdle, see if I can figure out technology and share my screen. Uh, let's see, can everyone see the first slide? 
Can roll yeah, this you're again. good. Yeah, you're great. Excellent. So here we go. Uh, aggression is a fascinating topic. Um, it is also, unfortunately, a very misunderstood topic. And I think I would say it's one of the most misunderstood concepts in the horse world. My hope with this uh, webinar is to dispel some of the more common myths around aggression, um, give you some practical tools that you can take with you in your interactions with horses, and also, hopefully, perhaps give you a newfound appreciation for the complexities of horse behavior and horse communication. So we will dive right in and we will start by watching this video. So this is an excerpt from a documentary called uh, Buck, which aired in 2011 and followed horse trainer Buck Brannaman. Some of you might know him. Uh, there's a content warning for this clip. It is quite violent and it does show a person getting hurt, not seriously, but still. So just so you're aware of that. And I will play the clip now. We will leave it at that. I will not comment it further now. We're going to watch it again at the end of the presentation. And hopefully if I do my job right in the next 25 minutes or so, you will see this clip with slightly different eyes. Uh, and you will see some details that you perhaps did not pick up on this time around. So the first thing we have to do is define what aggression is. Because we all know that what we just saw was aggression, but what is it? biologically, fundamentally, scientifically. Aggression is not an emotion and it is not one behavior. It is an umbrella term for many behaviors uh, that arise in many circumstances and serve a variety of purposes. So it's quite complex. But what we do know about aggression is that it exists in pretty much all animals, vertebrates and invertebrates. And that tells us that it has a long evolutionary history, that it probably evolved in our common ancestors way, way, way back when in deep time. And the fact that it still exists in pretty much every species tells us as well that it serves an important evolutionary purpose. Otherwise, we would have lost aggression because nature hates waste, that we don't have behaviors, we do not have um, functions that do not serve an evolutionary purpose. Evolution favors two things only, survival and reproduction, and that is also an important clue when we look at aggression. Aggression will serve one of these goals, potentially both. And we also know that all aggression does not look the same. You can have different types of aggression that will manifest in different situations, but they will also look quite differently. And if you look here on the right, these two photos illustrate that quite nicely. So both of these are examples of intramale aggression in horses. So at the top, you have two stallions in a full on fight. And at the bottom, you have a gelding who is doing uh, um, a, a posturing behavior, so stallion posturing behavior, which is a highly ritualized form of intramale aggression uh, that precedes the actual fighting. So both are examples of the same type of aggression that serves the same purpose, but look very, very differently. And aggression is arguably the most well-studied complex of behaviors in the world, in all species and also in horses. The first uh, proper agonistic ethogram is almost 30 years old at this stage, so we know a lot about aggression in horses. And it was a challenge, let me tell you, to fit it all into 25 minutes. Um, so naturally, we're only going to scratch the surface of everything that there is to say about this. But hopefully, uh, you know, if there's anything you want to know, just ask and I will, I'm more than happy to talk about this for hours. So we know aggression, uh, there are many different types of aggression that serve specific purposes and that they look quite differently. And here are just some examples. We have horses that are aggressive around food, around water. We have horses that play fight, that fight for real. 
horses that are defending themselves against a predator, protecting their offspring. And all of these varied examples, if we were to shoehorn them into some sort of categories, nature abhors a category, but we love it. It helps us talk about things and helps us think about things. So if we were to shoehorn them into some broad categories, we'd end up with something like this. Aggression serves three distinct purposes, protecting a resource, creating distance to another individual and staying safe. Now, the more perceptive of you might realize right away that these often overlap. If a mare is protecting her offspring, for example, is she creating distance to another individual or is she protecting a resource? And again, that's because everything in nature is very complex and so is aggression. But thinking about aggression in terms of these three purposes can help us when we're trying to identify it in a real world situation and we're trying to understand it. So emotion is not, emotion, aggression is not an emotion, but aggression has underlying emotions and is driven by underlying emotions. And in a very simplified fashion, we can think of it this way. We have a situation that arises, that situation is perceived by the horse through its senses, and the brain then makes an appraisal of the situation and decides on how to act. And that action then manifests as a behavior. But crucially, this whole process will have an underlying emotion and that emotion will form at the appraisal stage. Depending on the balance of this emotion, depending on what this emotion will be, that will affect the behavior. And when it comes to aggression in horses, there are two main emotional systems that are at play. One of them is anger. Uh, quite intuitively, anger would be uh, the, do the dominant, the primary emotional system activated when we're looking at, for example, resource guarding or when we're looking at creating distance to another individual. But another emotional system that is often quite overlooked when we're talking about aggressive behavior is fear. And fear is equally as important as anger. As a non-territorial prey animal, a horse will preferentially flee from danger. If they perceive a threat, they will want to leave. They will want to run away. But if they can't, for whatever reason, if they cannot flee, they will fight. So horses that perceive a threat and want to escape from it but can't, will resort to aggressive behavior. And this is really, really key to understanding a lot of the aggression that we see in horses, uh, in domesticated horses. There is another pathway here as well that I wanna to briefly touch on that is even more overlooked than the flight, fear flight pathway. And that is the um, fear shutdown pathway. This one is a little bit more complex. It happens to horses that are under severe emotional stress for a long period of time and are subjected to repeated punishment. So what they do is they, sh they basically stop behaving. They shut down in an attempt to avoid being noticed and in, avoid in an attempt to avoid more punishment. And this often looks like obedience on the outside, but on the inside, it's emotional turmoil. And these shut down horses can often come unraveled. Eventually, they will snap. And, the, and they will often then go from zero to really, really severe aggression. And in my experience, this shutdown mechanism is what we see in a lot of these chronic, really severe aggression cases that kind of come out of nowhere. Um, we often have an element of this. And if we have time at the end, I, there's, I have a case study of a horse that... Um, that is a perfect example of this. So these horses, they're often uh, marketed as dead broke or as um, bomb proof. And let me tell you right now, if anybody's trying to sell you a bomb proof horse, you run in the other direction because you do not want to be around when that comes unraveled. There are no bomb proof horses. It's always, it's, it's always a big red flag. Right. Now aggression, this is kind of, this is a this is a key thing in this entire webinar that I really really want you to internalize. Aggression is often pathologized. We often view aggression as something bad, something dangerous, something abnormal. And 
it can absolutely be a symptom of pain, for example, or fear or poor welfare, which we will talk about uh, a few slides on. But fundamentally, it's just a way of communication, of communi it's a method of communication between horses. And horses have really elaborate social communication. Um, and aggression is a, a natural and a normal part of that. Because aggression costs energy, and aggression costs social relationships, and aggression can also lead to injury which can lead to death. So there's a high cost to aggression and in especially in uh, social dynamics, horses want to avoid aggression as much as possible. So they have developed a really complex set of, uh, uh, of behaviors to communicate, to avoid having to escalate to aggression. Uh, I have pulled them together in what I call the equine ladder of aggression. Uh, this is not a Bible, this is, uh, graphic that is supposed to be a simplified tool that we can use when we're interacting with horses. So while there is a clear hierarchy here between green and amber and red behaviors, there will be a lot of individual variability. And some horses might show certain behaviors, but not others, or they might uh, jump back and forth more than others. And the escalation will also be very individual. But in general, broadly speaking, you will have at the very, the bottom rung of the equine ladder of aggression, you will have uh, what are called appeasement behaviors. There's some kind, sometimes called the calming signals as well and warning signals. And basically these are quite subtle changes in facial expression and in demeanor that are picked up really well by other horses. And it's stuff like turning the head away or the neck, um, licking and chewing and yawning changes in blink frequency. So if they blink slightly more or slightly less, the little worry wrinkle that they get just above their eyes, <clears throat> sniffing the ground, and these like little floppy side ears. A rung above that, you'll have showing the flanks or turning the side and slightly elevating the neck and the head. But we're still, this is still what I would describe as green zone. So this is still quite subtle. Then, Amber zone, you will have uh, a slight escalation. You will have more stomping of the legs and flicking of the tail. You will have the ears back, but not necessarily completely slipped back. Uh, you will have tight, tighter, a tightness around the muzzle and the lips and the nostrils. Uh, you'll have a head shake and the horse will often turn its hindquarters as well. And then Another rung higher up, you will have an extended teeth and ears slicked back. And then another rung up, you will have bared teeth and perhaps a leg that is lifted. Now, for me, these are amber behaviors still. So you're still not, these are not kick or bite threats. These are still warning signals where the horse is telling you, you are really ticking me off. So please stop whatever you're doing. And then if you, if these signals are ignored, that's when they go to what I would uh, categorize as red zone behaviors. So kicking or biting the air, and then that is almost inevitably followed by kicking and biting or attacking the individual um, that this is directed at. Now in, so in among horses, horses will be really, really, really good at reading these green zone behaviors, and they will be really good at respecting them. They will be, that's the polite thing to do in, in you know, horse to horse social communication is if somebody tells you to please move away or not eat their food or leave their baby alone, you respect that. And that is kind of the foundation of uh, equine social, um, social networking, social relationships is this kind of avoidance and, res and, and respecting of the appeasement signals and friendly behavior. So overt aggression is really rare in stable social groups for this reason. Let's take a look at some videos just to see what that can look like in practice. So here, the horse on the right is Diamond and the horse, uh, or pony on the left is Fagin. They are meeting for the first time. So these are riding school ponies. And they're meeting for the first time. So this can look quite dramatic, but if we actually watch it back, Diamond is being quite polite here. So he's still in the green zone. He's He is escalating to turning his back and hindquarters and lifting his leg a little bit, and, and sorry, elevating his neck, shaking his head. And that facial expression of tension. 
But Fagan responds by moving away. He responds by moving away and then Diamond immediately de-escalates by sniffing the ground and going down a step on the ladder. So it's a really nice and polite interaction here actually. And it never escalates to anything more than this because they're both respecting each other's signals and, and communicating clearly. Uh, one more example of what this can look like in practice. So this is Cleo and her baby Odin, who's just a few days old. And this is my horse, Jay. So Jay and Cleo are, they were, were unfortunately Cleo is not longer with us, but they were, um, they loved each other very, very much. So this is the first time they meet after Odin has been born. And it's a really interesting interaction. because there are two different resources at play here that they are guarding, right? So Cleo is guarding Odin. She's not ready for Jay to meet him, but Jay just wants his pile of hay. <laughs> He's not even really guarding it. He just says he wants to eat it. So watch back how the subtlety of the back and forth communication between them and the fact that this never escalates to anything dramatic. Do you see how Jay turns his head has the lowered ears, blinks more frequently, has that little worry wrinkle. His entire facial expression is basically a whole, you know, he's just showcasing all the appeasement signals in the green zone. And that's his way of communicating to Cleo that like, I don't want to, I don't want to walk away. I really want this pile of hay right now, but I'm also not a threat. I'm not, I'm not interested in your baby. I'm not going to do anything to you right now. And there's a, there's a complexity here because he could also walk away but he decided not to, but he's still being very clear that all he wants is his pile of hay. So in the end, Cleo walks away and he doesn't follow. And so nothing dramatic really happens. You still have aggression, but quite low on that ladder of aggression. So we've established that aggression serves particular purposes that are um, evolutionary old and robust and coded in all animals. And we've established that aggression also for, serves an important uh, communicative and social role in, uh, in um, horse society. But there are certain things that will specifically cause aggression, that will trigger aggression, and that will also amplify aggression. And they are in no particular order pain, both acute and chronic pain, very, very, very um, big trigger for aggression. The expectation of pain as well, if a horse expects pain, that can trigger aggression. Uh, restraint or loss of autonomy, and this includes psychological restraint. So just believing that they don't have any other option, that they are restrained can be a trigger for aggression. Lack of sufficient resources, lack of sufficient space, a threat to social stability, so strained horses, unfamiliar horses, horses being humans coming in and taking horses out of a field. All of these are threats to social stability. Threats to offspring will trigger aggression in both mares and, and stallions. Hunger, uh, social isolation will trigger aggression. Frustration, irritation, frustration as in uh, um, not getting the expected outcome and irritation such as for example just something that is mildly annoying like you know flies on a hot summer day or hot temperatures all of this can can uh, trigger uh, aggression and punishment punishment triggers aggression as well in all species including horses and when we're looking at this list it is overwhelming but what is important to remember here that all of these work together so you will very rarely have you know in a life you will rarely have one thing isolated from the other. You will often have a combination of these factors when you have some, some manifestation of aggression. And a good way to think about it, I think, is the uh, analogy of the bucket. So if you, uh, if you just think of your horse as a bucket and of every, every one of these causes or triggers as a drop, one drop might not cause a strong reaction, might not lead to the bucket overflowing, but many, over time will fill the bucket and then you will get a strong reaction. So it's just um, just uh, an easier way to kind of think about these things, how these all these causes will compound and they will amplify each other and can uh, trigger and, and worsen aggression as well. Now aggression is more common in domestic horses than in feral horses. In feral horses and in, in a stable social group, 
in a natal band, for example, you will have near zero aggression, obvious overt aggression. But that is because you will have this subtle uh, communication with the green zone appeasement signals and everybody will respect these. So there will never be any need for this overt aggression. In domestic horses, aggression is much higher simply because they have more cause to be aggressive. So all of the causes that I have outlined here in red are more likely to happen to a domesticated horse than to a feral horse, simply as, um, as an effect of how we keep them, how we train them, the equipment we use and the things we do to them. Um, so that is something that is good to remember. The wild aggression is a natural and normal uh, set of behaviors. And while it is an important means of communication, the overt aggression that is so prevalent in domesticated horses, which was interesting because we saw it in the poll as well, that most of you had experienced the, seen aggression in horses um, quite often. That is because they are given more reasons to be aggressive as, a, as an effect of the way that we keep them and manage them simply. What about dominance then? So this is just, these are just some excerpts from the web, from reputable sources on the web, including the FEI website and some quite big name trainers. So as you can see, the idea that aggression and dominance are connected is quite common, uh, but it is a pervasive and very, very damaging myth that I want to right here, right now with you guys, once and for all, kill, bury and salt the earth behind me because this myth needs to die. As I've already mentioned, we know a lot about aggression in horses. It is probably one of the most, the best studied uh, behavioral complexes in horses. And study after study has found that there is essentially no connection between aggression and dominance. Uh, the most dominant horses are not the most aggressive ones and the most aggressive horses are not the most dominant ones. In fact, when studying dominance and rank relationships in horses, avoidance is much more important than aggression. Avoidance will give you more information about the social relationships than who is aggressive. Additionally, dominance is not very relevant in horse-human interactions in general, which is unfortunately beyond the scope of this webinar. If there are any questions about it, I'll be happy to answer them, but I will signpost you to this excellent, excellent review paper from 2017. And there will be a link to it in the resources for the webinar as well, but definitely do give it a read. It really explains why dominance and leadership aren't relevant in horse-human interactions and why we should look beyond that. So I'll just signpost this here. So what should we do if our horses do behave aggressively? Well, the equine ladder of aggression is a good place to start. First of all, I'd say be polite respect the subtle signs, respect the green zone signs. It's the polite thing to do because what your horse is telling you in this situation is that whatever situation they are in, whatever you are do doing to them right now, they are not comfortable with. They don't like it for some reason. And it's, it's a decent thing to do is just say, I'm, you know, I, I respect that. So it's a polite thing to do, but it's also the safe thing to do because Horses are big animals and we are tiny humans and aggression can become very, very dangerous to us very, very fast. So respecting the early warning signals and backing away at that moment, I think is, it's both the polite and the smart thing to do. So once we've done that, you know, if you, then we need to fundamentally not punish the horse for doing this. And there are many reasons for this. Again, not something I really have time to go into here, but I have written an entire article about that, which should also be linked in the resources that I can, uh, for the webinar that I can recommend. But fundamentally, punishment increases aggression. So using it to deal with aggression is probably not a good idea. Um, also, because we know that aggression is communication, if we punish often the aggression that we see, we are rubbish at seeing the green light behaviors. So the behaviors that we see are the amber light behaviors, right? That's what we start to punish. The problem with that is that the horses are just going to learn to not show the amber light behaviors and instead jump straight to the red light behaviors because we fundamentally don't change the emotion, which is causing, we, we're not, we're not changing the cause, not changing the emotion of the aggression. So that, that will still be there. Next thing we need to do is consider the situations that the aggression arises in. 
um, and really write them down. And I strongly suggest keeping a diary because our memory isn't as good as we think it is. So I strongly suggest writing down day, time, weather, um, which other individuals are around because aggression can be very contextual. So aggression can be decreased or increased depending on other individuals, both horses and humans that are around. So write down as many details as possible. Then make sure that you provide all basic needs, um, a stable social group, 24 seven access to, um, to, to forage to satisfy the eating behavior and ideally freedom to move. A home range can be for uh, in feral um, free ranging horses can be up to 50 square kilometers and they can move 10 to 20 kilometers a day when given the opportunity. That's not something we ever provide for domesticated horses pretty much. But you will be surprised how many behavioral issues, including aggression, just magically go away once we satisfy friends, forage and freedom. So definitely make sure to do that. And finally, address the root cause. Once you've identified the root cause, address the root cause. And I will say this, never, 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 never rule out pain. Pain is a common reason for aggression. And if it's not the direct primary reason, it will amplify the aggression. So always consult with a vet, especially if your horse is suddenly displaying aggression from in, in particular context. Talk to your vet. Now, I will say not all vets recognize aggression as a symptom of pain, unless there are other symptoms that were as well. So do, but do, so, but, a, but a lot of vets are, are starting to realize that now. So definitely talk to your vet and ask them for recommendations on what to do. Never rule out pain when you're dealing with aggression. It's always there in the background. Finally, we've come to the end. I am a little bit over time, but hopefully we'll have time to just watch this video again. And now, given what you know about the evolutionary background of aggression, the purpose it serves, the emotions underlying it, and also the causes that trigger it, and the fact that it is a subtle and complex way of communicating. What do you see in this video? I do hope if I've done my job correctly, you will have seen that this was probably an entirely avoidable situation if the humans had thought things through a little bit better. We have um, a backstory for this colt. He is three months old, uh, sorry, three, three years old. He was orphaned at birth and born with the umbilical cord around his neck. So he probably suffered some oxygen deprivation. So we have a poorly socialized horse that hasn't had any maternal contact was raised by humans, which means that he hasn't had the he hasn't had any social contact with other horses. And he probably has a potential learning disability as well due to the oxygen deprivation. He has been poorly socialized. He hasn't learned. We know that orphaned animals struggle with emotional regulation. They that's something they learn from their mothers and that's something they learn from the social group. So he hasn't learned any emotional regulation. He hasn't learned any mitigation of aggression. He is socially deprived. He is in a strange location with unfamiliar horses, unfamiliar people. He's locked up. He's confined without escaping. He's restrained with a rope around his neck. And he has a he has a, pri a predator throwing a blanket onto his back. And he's being really polite. He's showing all the signs of, please stop, I'm really uncomfortable. But he's not being listened to. And in the end, he escalates to a red zone behavior and attacks. But this was entirely avoidable with just a little bit of common sense. And on that note, thank you for listening. We're a little bit over time, but I hope uh, Roly will forgive me. Uh, I will signpost you here to my Instagram, my Facebook and my Substack. You can find me there if you want to see um, some of the other stuff I post. If you're interested in horse behavior in general, I have some great resources there. Uh, thank you. Renata, that was brilliant. I more than forgive you. That was, uh, you know, I can listen to you for, forever. That was brilliant. So we'll put those links into uh, Facebook and Substack in the, in the chat as well. And lots of really good, um, positive uh, comments coming through. 
Um, so thank you for that, Renata. That's brilliant. Now, you are, you're you're getting ahead of the game here. We've got loads of questions already. Do remember, uh, uh, we can't really go into case studies. So if you've got individual case studies, we don't really have time to, well, we don't have time to get into that. So please keep your, your questions nice and succinct uh, and as general as possible. And do remember, if you're on Zoom, that you can upvote questions. So if there's a question there you like already, please just upvote it and it will rise to the top of the list and we'll mo most likely get through it. So um, before we move on, I'm now just going to uh, share my screen again and um, introduce, uh, we're going to go into the structured Q&A now. So I am delighted to um, introduce Claire who has been um, with World Horse Welfare since 2001. So if my maths are correct, 22 years ago, she has worked in every single farm. Uh, we have four centres across the country. She's worked at Bellwade in Scotland. She's worked at no uh, Hall Farm in Norfolk. And now she is centre manager of Glinda Spooner Farm, our Somerset Rescue and Rehoming Centre. So expect to see her in Lancashire sometime soon, which is of course our fourth Rescue and Rehoming Centre. Uh, as she, she is absolutely passionate about uh, equine welfare and rehab um, with a particular a strong interest in, in, in her musculoskeletal re rehabilitation and of course its positive impact on equine behaviour which obviously makes this evening or today's uh, webinar so relevant uh, to, to Claire. So delighted to have Claire on board. Uh, one thing you might not know about Claire is the fact that she is as, as well as being a passionate um, um, sort of advocate around horses, she loves her running uh, on her own two feet. Um, and she manages to fit five kilometre runs at, at, at most lunch times. So if you go to Glen Spooner Farm and see someone uh, tracking around for five k's, that um, she, that that is Claire, and she has done the most extraordinary uh, running events, if I can call that, across the country. Um, and she she uh, for those of you who know Claire, know that she has generally a pack of dogs at home, but she never knew she would be a cat person. And you'll be delighted to know she has been successfully trained by Biddy, her cat to be a cat person as well as the odd dog person too. So Claire, it's brilliant to have you with us and we are gonna go into a bit of a structured Q&A. Uh, do remember, if you're on Facebook, put your questions on the comment section. If you're on Z Zoom, put your questions in Q&A and do please upvote them if you like a question that you see. So Claire, just from a World Horse Welfare perspective, what are, what are the common behavioural issues that you see at the centre and, and what, what is the team's general approach to them? Hi, hi, Rowley. Hi, everybody. Um, so obviously we are dealing with a constantly changing population of horses. Uh, so it's really challenging for us to establish these really stable social groups. Uh, horses come to us with all sorts of medical problems, uh, behavioural problems. So uh, the, the fundamental, really important things for us are the three Fs, which Renata has, has covered beautifully, friends, forage, freedom, uh, creating that um, as, as efficiently as possible, um, creating as best we can. Uh, stable social groups. If horses come into us uh, in groups or with a companion, it's really important we keep those animals together at least through the, the early period of their rehabilitation um, and ensuring that we, if we are seeing unusual behaviour, that we're really quick to pick that up with our vet. Again, as, as Renata has has brilliantly covered already if, if we're providing a good social stable group and the friends forage freedom and we're still seeing aggressive odd behaviors with with certain individuals we would be picking that up with our vets pretty quickly for further investigation at least in the first instance brilliant thanks Claire that's grand um, Renata, you, you've provided so much food for thought in your presentation. What would you say is the most overlooked behavioural signal uh, given by horses that owners do not pick up on in your experience? Turning the head away and turning the neck away. I, it is, it, it's, I, it's not only a precursor of aggression. It's simply communication about I'm not comfortable what's happening now. It's one of these you know, appeasement signal saying that you need to slow down, walk away, take things slower, do approach differently. We often miss it because we don't know what to look for, but also because we often keep our horses tied in cross ties or tied up in front. So we do restrict their movement a lot. Um, 
So I'd say that's that's a really important one. If we once we start to see it, we can't unsee it. It'll you'll see it everywhere now. And just to pick up then, so sometimes turning the head away is a a green sign of aggression, and sometimes it's not. It's just a communication. What, what how would you differentiate between whether it's aggression or just communication? So it's. I think the way we should look at these appeasement signals is that they serve three purposes. They serve the purpose of uh, de-escalating a potential conflict, and they serve the purpose of um, uh, stopping, de- de-escalating a potential conflict, pre- preventing a potential conflict. And also, in my opinion, which hasn't been studied, so this is just what I believe, and if anyone wants to give me funding to study this, you know <laughs> how to find me. I also firmly believe that it's a re- reconciliation behavior that is shown after a conflict as well. So these these behaviors serve many communicative social purposes. And the reason it's on the ladder of aggression is not because it is an overt sign of aggression, but it is because it's one of these early signals of, I'm not comfortable here, which can then easily escalate. It can escalate to flight, but it can also escalate to aggression. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Claire, obviously, from a World Health Welfare perspective, we increasingly now see large groups of unhandled ponies um, and horses coming into the centres. So what what are your top tips or what are the top tips that you and the team have developed of working with unhandled and, and scared horses? That's a great question. And that follows beautifully from Renata's last point, because it's exactly that. It's learning to pay really, really close attention to those green signals. So when we're working with animals, we use positive reinforcement as much as possible. We'll use um, treats, food rewards as, as much as possible, wherever it's safe to do so, potentially through protected contact initially if we need to. Um, but we, if we can read the really, really, really early signals that gives us cues from the horses to help us stay below threshold. So we want the animals to be totally relaxed and enjoying the whole process of learning, learning to share our space, learning touch, learning to wear a head collar for the first time. Those things need to be broken down into tiny, tiny, tiny incremental steps. And if we get a green behaviour that Renata has explained, we know we've just gone a a tiny bit too far, we've been a tiny bit greedy. Uh, We find it super useful to video our sessions. The girls and the team will often just set up their phone, do a short session, maybe only five or 10 minutes, stop and go back and review the footage because oftentimes first time round you miss, you miss the stuff. So I'd say when you're, when you're working with your horses, being able to look back at what you saw um, is so, 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 so helpful. Really helpful. Just as a rider to that, Claire, do, do you find horses are, you know, some sort of progress really quickly and you say, and obviously you need to be careful, you don't overdo it, but they progress really quickly and others just for whatever reason, they, they don't and it just takes a lot longer? Yeah, a million percent. They all have very individual personalities. Some are really what we call like really optimistic learners, but whatever you present them, they're kind of they're up for it they think it's a good idea um and some are a little bit more pessimistic those those that do not learn in what we see as like a normal way if we're not making progress in the way that we would accept expect we're really quick to show that video footage to our vet and again start having those questions because if they're not progressing in a way that we would expect is reasonably normal in, in kind of in terms of time frame and behavior uh, we want to be ruling out pain and oftentimes, for example, when we're teaching head collar, um, there might be dental issues. Mm. Yeah. So head collar is uncomfortable, of course. So we're looking at those things pretty early on if they're not progressing as we would expect. But equally, there, there is a variation and you, people shouldn't get worried if, if their horse is not progressing as quickly as someone else's horse, just because that just might be the individual case of that horse. Yeah, absolutely. They're all completely unique. You can't compare one horse to another and expect them to look the same. Brilliant. Now, Renata, I specifically said to people it, we, we don't have time for case studies this evening or, to, or for, for this webinar. Um, but 
a, a, probably a case study is the best way to answer this question. Do, do you have a case study where you've had to think outside the box um, uh, in terms of how you've managed a, a, a case of aggressive behaviour in a horse? Yes, actually, my own pony. <laughs> so some of you, some of you who do follow me on social media, might know him as Turbo, uh, and he lives up to his name. He's very, very fast. Turbo, um, when he came to me, he had been trained with with food rewards, but not in a systematic way. And I am a positive reinforcement trainer, so I use uh, food rewards as kind of the staple of the basis of my of my training. So we started doing it more systematically, and he had a lot of frustration around food, uh, which we have worked away um over time he's been with me now for four years almost but it's the resi there's it's residual it's still there and he would not disengage from me i could give him when i was doing training with food i'd give him food on the floor and he would not disengage he would become aggressive he would become aggressive towards me and it made no sense because I was giving him all the food, all the resources. I was walking away from the resources and it made no sense to me what was going on here. And he'd walk away from food and follow me aggressively. And I realized that is not the food that he wants. It's the company. Hmm. And because he's not the smartest pony in the he's the fastest pony in the world, but he's not the smartest pony in the world. When I walk away, I am a resource to him, not the food, but my company. When I walk away, that makes him angry because he's about to lose his resource. And when he's angry, he's lashing out. And the only thing he can lash out at is the person that he wants to stay. And I think this is this is a real moment for me, a realization. And I hope I can pass it on to some of the listeners now as well, that the, the object of the aggression isn't always the target of the aggression. The horses do redirect and sometimes this frustration if if there's a frustration and some you know for other reasons they can target you or other horses even though that's not the primary cause of the aggression if that makes yeah. sense yeah, yeah. so what i learned with him was simply to give him time to disengage never walk away from him you know wait just yeah. calmly stand next to him and he will disengage he will start grazing or walking away and then that's fine. But if, um, if he has the sense of me trying to run off, that triggers him a lot. So with him, it was the opposite, you know, just when he gets angry, not don't run, don't make a big fuss, just stand, scritches, you know, be with him, just let him calm down. And once he's done, he's done. And it, it works. And then like the time becomes shorter and shorter. Brilliant. That's an excellent, excellent example. And, and wonderful. It, it was your own podium as well. Um, Claire, what are your top management tips for avoiding aggressive behaviour between horses at the centre? Um, so again, the the base, just the real basics: friends, forage, freedom, making sure that resources um, are really widely spread within areas. So if we've got six, seven horses sharing a field, making sure that there are at least double the the number of horses piles of of forage, more than one source of water um, making sure that there's adequate space for horses to get um, away from each other so um, having more than one area of shelter having a, um, a hedge line through the middle of the field with entrances both ends anything that allows the horses as Renata was just explaining to disengage move away um, that should provide as stress-free um, environment as possible but also just being super super careful with herd dynamics like people some of the horses that come to us um, have better social skills than others um, some have fairly poor social skills or have experienced social isolation um, just by slightly adjusting the herd dyna dynamic we can um, usually keep everybody pretty happy Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Right. We've got a mountain of questions to go. Before we do that, just to remind you that in two weeks time uh, is our next webinar, which is 29th of November. And that is with Dr. Gemma Pearson and um, from the Horse Trust and uh, Edinburgh Vet School. And she's going to be talking along with Eileen um, around the principles of training horses based on learning theory which is very much a first cousin of um, what we're talking about today on today's webinar. And we'll put a sign up for, for that webinar in two weeks time in the chat function. 
it is brilliant that there are so many people joining us here tonight. And I'll give you a short um, sort of review of across the UK. We have people from um, all the home nations. Then we have, are you ready? Sweden, Switzerland, Netherlands, Norway, Finland, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Slovenia, Denmark, Poland, Spain, Belgium, France, French Guyana, USA, Ecuador, Canada, Mexico. Um, and I'm sure I've missed some out as well. So it's brilliant that so many of you have joined us this evening. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and do remember, in future, if you would like us to cover a particular topic in a future webinar, then do uh, email us on education at worldhorsewelfare.org. Right, now into the questions. First one to, to you, Renato, if that's OK. When a horse yawns, is that always aggression? Or isn't it sometimes a horse letting go of some stress? It is... Um... So the way we should consider yawning is as uh, it's a complex behavior. Once again, you know, there are no there are no firm boundaries or categories in nature. Everything is hugely complex and it's, it is not always associated with aggression, but it's it's one of these um, appeasement behaviors that kind of come uh, post conflict. Um, so it is, in a, in a sense, a way of letting go. It, it is associated with a previous um previous increase in, in stressful arousal um but it's also that can that stress can also be social stress does that make sense so then it yeah. comes kind of as a and it becomes a lot of the stuff you know there's physiological reasons for everything we do but it's all all the things we do also have communicative reasons so these are these go hand in hand so physiologically it often comes as after a period of stress but through evolution that has then become um an important means of communication as well. Brilliant, excellent answer. Great question for Marjam. Um, Natasha has asked Claire, how do you tell the difference between aggression signs and pain signs? You've touched on this already, but in you, in your exper in experience at the farm, how, how do you separate out whether they're aggression or pain signs? Or... Um, that is that is so tricky because I think as Renata has, has explained already, so often uh, there will be such a huge overlap um that it can be a bit chicken and egg but certainly any behavior that we see perceive as uh, as aggression or a horse generally being quite unhappy we would be having a, a conversation with our vet to rule out pain in the first instance and once we are satisfied that there isn't pain then we would be more confident that it is aggression if that makes sense i'm sure renata will have uh, comments to add to to that. So. Renata, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think the so I think the question is, is uh, comes at it from the wrong angle because aggression is a sign of pain. Yeah, aggression is one of the symptoms of pain. So you'd have an underlying painful experience which will lower your threshold for showing for displaying aggressive behaviors in different situations so i don't think they can really be disentangled which is why i i, I want to be very clear that if you have a horse that's especially a horse that suddenly shows aggression in a situation that it never has shown aggression in before and that don't really make sense in any other way always always consider that pain could be a factor and if you have um, so, for example, my other horse um, fractured his cough, uh, his coffin bone a few years ago, and he now has arthritis in that joint. He's going to live with that until he doesn't. That will inevitably make him more grumpy. It will lower that threshold for aggression. So it is a symptom of that, um, but it's not the only symptom. I hope that made sense. I don't know if I just made a mess of everything, Claire, but that was my No, I think the, <laughs> my the point about... Um... Uh, uh, pain being one cause of aggression is a, is a is a really really important one but i suppose equally you know a, a horse in pain is not always going to show aggressive yes. behavior is it yeah. yeah yeah absolutely um marjam's also asked uh, do, do you mean that a horse that licks and chews mm -hmm. always shows aggression renata so it's the same thing as with the yawning there. So the licking and chewing is physiologically um, just the re the, the re upregulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the rest and digest system after a period of stress and sympathetic activation. So they're just kind of the balance shifts and it's upregulated. The horse starts to salivate and therefore licks and chews, but it follows after a potentially a mildly stressful, mildly to moderately stressful event, including social stress. And that's where that's where it comes in as one of these green light signs on the the lower lung the lower rungs on the equine ladder of aggression. 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, Claire, uh, Renata uh, talked about this shutdown behaviour. Uh, how do you um, identify um, an animal at the centre uh, that you think may be expressing shutdown behaviour? Yeah, shutdown, shutdown behaviour is something we see relatively rarely within the centres, um, but once you see it, um, it, it really is very, very striking. It's it's almost um, like a shell of a horse. It's the most heartbreaking, sad thing to see. Um, often in the very few times that we see genuinely shut down horses, again, this overlap with pain, often there is a, a complex pain issue. Um, and once that is resolved and the horse is rehabilitated to live in a more natural, socially um, stable environment. A, a lot of that seems to remedy itself over time, um, but that is just our, our very limited experience. It's not something we tend to see very often in horses coming to us. Okay, brilliant. Um, Renata, Jenny's asked, what about aggression due to trauma in the past? even if they ha now have the friend's freedom and forage, if they've had trauma in the past, how does that, can that come out as aggression? Yes, is the short answer to that. Um, again, behavior is very, very complex. And especially, I think when we're looking at our modern domesticated horses, almost all of them are severely traumatized from their past, simply because most of them have been weaned at six months old. And six months is way too young to wean a foal. They would normally not stop not stop uh, nursing until they are about somewhere between eight and 10 months up to a year in the natural state. And they would still stay with the natal band until they're about two, three years old. And sometimes they would nurse for that time as well because nursing is very much a social behavior. And we're taking them often from, so we're taking them from, we're breaking the maternal bond, which is a hugely traumatic event in any animal's life. And we know from other species that it is associated with uh, emotional dysregulation, um, lack of empathy, um, increased aggression, increased fearfulness. So we're creating these poorly socialized horses. So I think it's safe to assume that most of the modern horses that we are dealing with have some element of trauma that manifests in their behavior. And it can be just a lowered threshold for aggression, for example, so that they will simply respond, respond with aggression earlier than a horse that wouldn't have been in this situation. But again, aggression is not all or nothing and there's huge inter-individual variability. So you can't really, and nothing is really predictive. You have to kind of look at the horse in front of you. Um, but if you have a horse that seems to kind of struggle a lot, then perhaps experiences in the past could be an explanation, but experiences in, in the past are not predictive of the behaviors a horse will show in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, thank you, Renata. So I'm just, there are so many questions coming in. I'm, I'm struggling to keep up. Um, Ellie and Dan have asked, uh, Claire, uh, can you explain more what you mean by shutdown? What, 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 what are horses showing with shutdown or not showing? So for, for us in pro layman's terms, um, we would see horses that I would say are not displaying normal behaviors, not interacting with their environment or their handlers in a normal way, um, standing, staring at a blank wall, no real responses to all of the normal things, all of the normal things that we'd expect, expect to see when you approach a happy horse and he pricks his ears and turns towards you and maybe has a little wicker or moves over to you. This shut down horses um, are, are demonstrate behavior that I can only really describe as being like a statue. Um, there, there's nothing there, absolutely no normal responses at all. And then as Renata has, has explained, they'll suddenly, uh, they go into a really heightened flight response and you and you would look at them and, and say, where, where did that come from? There was none of this green light stuff. This horse was, was not even paying attention to anything that's going on around him and then suddenly this explosive normally for us flight behavior rather than um aggression yeah. towards towards handlers i hope that makes more sense um, brilliant no, that's great thank you um renata lease has asked obviously um we're not doing case studies but gastric ulcers is quite common in our horses um and 
uh, uh, Lisa's horse is being medicated, but still showing signs of aggression, especially towards herself. Um, and it's that very out of character. What, 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 what would you advise there? So if, if your horse has been diagnosed with ulcers, then I would, it's, it's, it's likely that that's where the aggression comes from. At least that's a major cause of the aggression. And it can take some time for ulcers to heal. And it can also take some time for the expectation of pain. As you said, expectation of pain, especially if a horse has had ulcers for a long time, they might be expecting pain in certain situations and brace against that. And that could also manifest as kind of heightened aggression. If you see no improvement despite medication and perhaps scoping again and actually getting it confirmed that the medication is helping, then perhaps there are other causes at play as well that are interacting with this. So the ulcers were one cause, but you might be also looking at others. And then, you know, like I said, a good way would be to start writing a diary and really just like as mundane a detail as possible, the weather, the temperature, because maybe they're cold, maybe they're hot, maybe it's insects, maybe it's something else. So write down all the situations where you kind of see this aggression and also start looking for like the the subtler signs and once you have that diary that can you can also bring that to your vet and talk to your vet and say well is there anything here that makes sense to you from a clinical perspective why my horse would still be showing aggression in these situations and then look through the list of causes and see if any of these can can fit and you can do any changes there as well but definitely it can also be a learned behavior in the sense that they remember um they remember situations that will cause them pain yeah Yes, thank you. Um, Claire Rabini's asked, um, what what do, what do you do at the centre when uh, a, a, one of the animals will show aggressive behaviour to a common situation, such as brushing or picking out of feet? Um, so when when horses come in to us, whether they've been handled before or not, we tend to start retraining right at the absolute very beginning. Um, and just cover off all of the basic learning to make sure horses have understood each bit of the skill. You know, horses are in incredibly good at kind of guessing what we want them to do a lot of the time, but they maybe don't really understand um, our expectations of them, for example, when we're asking them to stand to be groomed. So we would make sure that we are covering off that process um, and staying below threshold. So not seeing any of this green light behaviors um, and progressing through using positive reinforcement. Generally, horses seem to really like grooming, touch, that kind of thing. It's a really social thing. So if we are seeing a horse um, consistently being quite grumpy or unhappy about being groomed, again, we want to rule out pain. Um, we want to make sure that there's not ulcers, back pain, all of that sort of thing going on as well. Um, and also just paying attention to the brush which uh, I know sounds really, really common sense, but sometimes the modern brushes, nylon bristles, um, can create a bit of static. If you're standing wearing a fleece, the horse has just had his rug off. Even that can be quite uncomfortable. So it's just um, paying attention sometimes to those little details as well. Um, yeah. and, and then generally we, we don't see a problem. So. Can, I add a, can I add a short go, go, Yeah, go on. So when we talk about pain, we often talk about, you know, clinical manifestations, you know, we talk about ulcers, we talk about um, colic, we talk about dental issues, so actual physical issues that are wrong. But there's also a level of discomfort that might just be individual based on, for example, some horses don't like being touched in certain places, they might be sensitive to being brushed, as Claire said. So I think that's important to remember as well, that if, you, if, you, if you've gone through your horse with all, every vet in the country and every physio in the country and your horse is still reacting to being touched, maybe they just don't like being touched and not, and that's okay. Maybe this particular horse doesn't need to be touched. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Um, Renata, Julia has asked, are there any resources for distinguishing aggression versus play? Oh, um, yes. So play is aggression, but just a different, it's just a different manifestation of uh, intramale aggression. But again, this becomes very scientific, but I get what you, I understand what you're asking. And yes, so in play, you tend to, as opposed to actual fighting, you tend to see a much more, uh, you see, tend to see reciprocation. So there'll be much more back and forth. There won't be one horse attacking uh, and another one defending, but there'll be 
they'll be lunging at each other and it'll be a it'll be you'll notice that they take turns you'll also notice that there will be that will ebb and flow much more than in an actual fight so you know they'll fight each other play fight each other and then they will relax a little bit and then it will come again and they will relax a little bit so ebb and flow and in play fighting as well you will not see any you shouldn't see many injuries you might see some scrapes but you shouldn't see you know proper bite wounds proper kick wounds because that's not the point of play fighting and you will often not hear any vocalization whereas in fighting you should hear screaming and 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 you know much more kind of it will be much more vocal so these are good you know when you're actually standing there in a field and you're not sure what you're actually looking at you can think about these criteria to help you sort of distinguish between play fighting and actual fighting. Thank you. <laughs> that. Claire, Sarah's asked, I mean, obviously the, the, part of the reason for this webinar is to get people to understand that aggression is a behavior we can influence and not a label that we should give to a horse for it to be um, have for the rest of its days. But are there any situations where aggression in your experience it is an inherent characteristic that cannot be influenced. Was that directed to me now? That, that's for Claire. I was just wondering from the centre perspective, do, do, have you had experience of horses that come into us that we haven't been able to influence their aggressive behaviour? There, there certainly have been rare cases where we have not been able to completely eliminate certain behaviors in certain circumstances um and as renata has said those those individuals have almost certainly experienced really extreme trauma um at some point and i think we have to as their care as their caregivers um make reasonable adjustments for those animals where it's safe to to do so and have realistic expectations if there is a certain horse who finds that he absolutely cannot have his feed in a social situation. Just remove him from the field, feed him, put him back. That those kinds of situations um, that ordinarily can be quite easily worked around with a, a little bit of extra effort. But I, I think humans have to have pretty realistic expectations um, given what some of our horses have experienced. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, Marta has asked Renata, what is the difference between the ethological definition of dominance and the concept that people have regarding it? Oh, wow. Ah, uh, <laughs> OK, uh, buckle up. I'll try to be brief. So basically, from an ethological, a scientific perspective, dominance is a specific term that denotes the relationship between two individuals in a specific context with regards to access to a limited resource. So say for example, me and Roly uh, are having, you know, at, at a cafe and we're down to our last croissant, right? Roly being CEO will be dominant in that situation. He will have primary access to the limited resource, which is the, which, which is the only croissant available. And I will just have to say, that's fine, you know, not on me, I will be the subordinate. But then say, we come to another situation, for example, with my my horse. And then Rolly says, well, I want I want to take your horse with me now. And I say, no, it's my horse. In that situation, that resource, I will be the dominant one. So dominance is, is very um, specific to a particular context. And it can also shift and change over time. So it's not a character, it's not a personality trait. It's not a character trait, but it is regarded to a specific resource in a specific situation. The way we talk about dominance is often about some sort of conflated with like leadership and assertiveness and aggression often. Um, but that is because we are the worst species of all the species and we horses are not that way. They are not uh, <laughs> like that at all. So I hope that makes sense. There's a lot more to say, but that is kind of the general definition. So you will have dominance hierarchies in horses, but they will shift if you take and you, and they are, again, between two individuals, not uh, the whole group. Brilliant. Thank you, Renata. And I should, I should say, I, I've, I've never been naive enough to think within World Horse Welfare that if there's any one class I'll, going, I'll get anywhere close to it. Um, but there you go. <laughs> um, Claire, Linda's asked, um, can, in your experience at the centres, can aggression be a learned behaviour? 
that is a question that, if you don't mind, I think I'll pass Absolutely. to Renata, actually, because I would believe not, but Renata will be able to put me right, I'm sure. <laughs> um, it's a hard one because we have to define learning. So aggression is learned. So learning, we tend to see learning as when we teach our horses learn, but horses learn all the time and they learn subconsciously. So if we define learning as simply, you know, remembering things that happen and adjusting to the environment and adjusting to the environment in the future, yes, aggression can be a learned behavior. Expectation of pain is a learned behavior in that sense. Um, in the sense that we can teach horses to be aggressive through reinforcement. In So the problem here is that aggression has a different cause. It has natural biological causes and it serves natural biological purposes. So it's not very easy to override that with reinforcement. You can't, I know of a case, I know of a case of a horse that was trained to um, attack a pillow using positive reinforcement. This is a this is a long story which we will not go into. It's a it's a friend of mine, my mentor, her horse, uh, learned to do that. It was really funny. He was one of these very, um, you know, if you if you if you marked a behavior, he knew he would do that behavior specifically. And they were trying to teach him to pick up a pillow with his teeth and just pick it up with his mouth. And he wouldn't quite get it, and they were a bit slow on the timing on the reinforcement. So he was getting a bit frustrated. And in the end, he just turns around and he just oh, stomps the pillow out of anger. And that is the moment that they click. And he was just like, okay, I get it now. So then he'd come up to that pillow and like a statue, he'd stand over it and just wait for the click. Is that uh, reinforced aggression? I mean, yes, but it's also not true. It's not true aggression. Does that make sense? It's yeah, yeah. just behavior. You don't have the emotion under underneath it because you can't reinforce an emotion. Um, and emotion is what drives aggression. So I would, uh, yeah, yeah. I would agree with... Claire, in the sense that we don't have to really be concerned about reinforcing it. Brilliant. Um, and then, uh, Renata, to, to Nora's asked, how do you, how to go, uh, sorry, the, 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 allow me to read this properly, how to go on with the green amber signs when you have to do important things like health procedures? Is sedation okay to manage those kind of signs? Yes. If you have a, if you have a horse that is, if you have a horse that needs an emergency procedure and you know that this horse is going to be terrified and potentially very dangerous in this situation and your vet deems it applicable from a clinical perspective, then I definitely think from a behavioral perspective, sedation is a good way to go. There are other things you can do. And I think the main thing is, a so there have been some studies on non-confrontational veterinary handling techniques. And what works really well is surprise, surprise, food, so basically distracting with, you know, something tasty and also to let it take time so that this, we kind of keep the stress levels quite low. So, and this is obviously not an easy thing to do if you have an overworked vet that needs to fit in another 15 clients at the end of the day. Um, but if your horse gets worked up, go take a little bit of a break if you can. But um, I definitely think I, I'm. I definitely think sedation is a good idea in in certain situations. Yes. Same thing goes for farrier rework. If you have a horse that is terrified of the farrier, work on it, train it, and then until you've actually gotten to a stage where you can train it, sedate your horse for the actual farrier, because otherwise you just keep triggering the negative experience, and you're never really going to get anywhere with the training. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Claire, Gianna's asked, um, how uh, helpful do you consider natural horsemanship principles to be uh, when dealing with aggressive horses? And is that something that, that, that you've adopted at the centres? Uh, so we tend to use uh, science and kind of evidence based positive reinforcement as much as possible um, and pressure and release. So the horses learn really predictable cues and get exactly the same predictable result, uh, reward, if you like, um, at the every time they offer a certain behavior and we apply that alongside sticking below threshold, so staying below where we're seeing this, these green behaviors. And that is the very basic kind of toolkit, if you like, the very basic menu 
um, but no two horses are exactly the same. Um, I think the principles of stay below threshold um, and make your rewards rewarding, which sounds so obvious, but as Renata said, some horses don't like touch. You can't make stroking, scratching a reward for a horse that doesn't like it. Um, some horses get too over the top with food rewards. So um, it essentially find a reward that's rewarding and stick below threshold and be consistent um, would, would really be my, my thoughts on that. Which is a very good segue to the webinar in two weeks' time, where we're talking about equine learning theory and and horse the principles of training horses based on equine learning theory. Um, so that was great, um, Renata. Um, when we rug our horses, uh, sometimes they will kick and bite the air. Um, it, it, what would you suggest in that type of situation? When your horse kicks and bites the air when you rug it, it's telling you that it doesn't like being rugged. Whatever happens in that, whatever it could be many, many factors, but that particular context and situation, they are not happy with. Uh, I there could be many things. Again, pain. So we could it could be connected to ulcers, for example, or back issues. It could be simply connected to past. I'm not saying you do it, but perhaps if somebody in the past has been a bit rough when rugging them, thrown the rug over and scared them, these could be issues. Um, I will say as well, it could, and again, it could be any type of issue. I know of a case where it was connected to uh, reproductive issues in a mare. So something with the, over so, and again, it could be any kind of thing. I would not rug a horse that is so clearly telling me they don't want to be rugged. Uh, I would look at some of the potential causes. If they do this in other situations, such as, for example, being saddled as well, or when you mount, or, you know, then I would definitely consider pain. If not, I would go back to kind of trying to um, counter condition the rugging. And again, simplest way to do that is take your time and give your horse food while you do it. And then I understand that sometimes you need to rug a horse for very different reasons. But most of the time, you don't need to rug your horse as much as you think you do. Most of the time, you can probably give it a few weeks and teach your horse to not uh, hate it as much as it does. Brilliant. Thank you. I, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, the, the welfare challenges that we provide our horses because we over rug them is, is a significant issue. So I think you're absolutely right to, to ask that question. Do you need to rug? Sometimes, of course, we do need to rug. And um uh, we absolutely understand that. So thank you for that, Renata. Julia's asked Claire, um, um, when you're f at feed time, horses can often show mildly aggressive ears back type behaviour. Should we be worried about that? Are you worried about that on the on the centres when you're at feed time? Horses put their ears back. Um, it's it's information, isn't it? For us, for, for me, I'd be reading that as um, an element of stress around food time. That's that that one precious little resource um, that the horse really, really doesn't want to share. If we are putting our horses into situations where, where we are inducing stress, I don't think that can ever be a good thing. So that's certainly something we wouldn't be doing. Um, spread If we're feeding multiple animals in a field that have a really stable social group and we can spread them right out and they're really comfortable, that's absolutely fine. Um, but if we start to see mild anxiety, so ears back, that sort of thing, we would just remove that animal from the group, feed him and, and put him back. Or in many of our fields, we've just created our own little electric fence holding pens. So each horse has his own space, he doesn't need to worry about guarding his resource. He's just got five minutes of his own space and his own time with all his friends in view. No one's going to nick his breakfast. Um, that just makes for a much, much happier life all round and much safer for our grooms because, of course, that behaviour could really quickly escalate um, and accidentally someone be run over or kicked, which, of course, we don't we don't want to ever get to that situation in the first place. It's much, much better to avoid. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. That's great. Um, Renata, Suzette's asked, where would you start with the horse that shows red zone aggression as the picture shows the horse over the stable door? So that horse will have showed the earlier warning signals as well. It's just very, we are very, very bad at observing our horses. I mean, there's been studies that have shown that we are rubbish at recognizing their behavioral signs. And there's often so much going on that we might miss them. So what I would do is I would um, 
try and approach the horse from a distance and wait and really, really observe, look for the tiniest little sign and see if I can find the, the, the sweet spot before it escalates. Because then you will know what your horse is comfortable with, whether that is you approaching the stall door, approaching with a rug, approaching with a saddle, whatever you're doing, you will know the comfort zone. This, as 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 Claire says, like that's kind of where you want to work with. You want to work ideally below the green zone, but you got to identify where that is first. So I would start just by doing that. It can help to film, for example, if you can, because um, then you won't have to pay attention in the moment. You can film it as well. And then based on that, depending on what kind of situation it is, progress gradually. But also, again, always kind of back to the causes, right? Keep that diary, write down every situation that happens in, write down how it changes and start thinking, what, what, is, what is the purpose of this aggressive behavior? Are they protecting themselves? Are they guarding a resource? Are they creating trying to create more distance? And once you kind of have identified the potential purposes, okay, what are the potential causes here? So that's how I would uh, suggest going about it. Brilliant. That is superb. Thank you. Um, yeah, you talked um, a bit about sort of pos positive reinforcement training. And Chloe's asked, when working with horses in positive reinforcement training, sometimes they'll turn their head away and bring their head back. Do you, do you have an understanding of that being a horse processing or a calming signal behaviour rather than specifically being aggression related? Uh, based on my experience, um, I would say that's probably a horse who's showing a little bit of ambivalence, maybe thinking about something. I think that without context, that's quite tricky to know. If I was working with a horse and introduced something, so we were always doing this incremental increases in our in what we're teaching if I just introduced something new like touch the head collar for the first time and I got that response I would just read that as, as potentially a little bit of ambivalence um but it, it is so context specific um it could be something as simple as the horse heard or saw something somewhere else that's why filming your session is so so helpful because oftentimes when you're up close and, and in the thick of it it's really hard to see where that's coming from. If that's something that's happening regularly, definitely film it. Um, and I'm sure if I can very quickly pass that to Renata, that she will have lots to add on that because that's a really interesting behaviour. I agree. I agree with everything Clara said pretty much. And I would also add that in a lot of positive reinforcement training, one of the foundation behaviours we teach is standing a neutral kind of polite standing still just because we want to not reinforce mugging for treats and looking for treats and at the start when we're teaching that what we'll often get is a fairly pronounced swing of the head away from us which we then reinforce and ideally some people keep teaching that others kind of make that go into a standstill facing forward so there is also an element that this could be a reinforced behavior but like claire says it depends entirely on what you've been reinforcing under what conditions this happens so again very complex uh, and that is something we need to consider in all training, whether we do negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement primarily. What we teach changes the behavior of our horses. And that can all, there's been a really interesting study that came out just last year that found that both friend, both fearful and crucially friendly behaviors towards the human in horses decreased over foundation training because we're just replacing them with other behaviors. Yeah. So I think that is just something to be aware of and be mindful of what behaviors we are teaching so that we don't lose that authenticity in the communication as well that can be really valuable. Brilliant, Renata. And uh, we're almost out of time. So final question, how would you do to you, Renata, how would you define conflict behavior in relation to aggression? Oh, um, so conflict behavior is, um, it's, it's all semantics really. And I think every ethologist is going to uh, define it slightly different. But conflict behavior to me is much more a situation of when a horse, they're in behavioral conflict. So they want, they are they are facing two different motivations and they can't do either. Um, so you'd often see them, you often see conflict behaviors in horses that are, for example, ridden with a very heavy hand and also strong leg aids because the leg aids tell the horse to move forward, but the strong hand tell the horse to stop and the horse has nowhere to go. And then you will often see manifestations of conflict behaviors in that situation. So to me, conflict behaviors are more behavioral conflict, i.e. the horse is stuck between 
to incompatible behaviors or incompatible motivators. Other ethologists, I'm sure, will define it slightly different. But to me, conflict does not denote aggression in this situation. I hope that makes sense. And from an ethological perspective, we talk about ag agonistic behaviors rather than conflict behaviors um, when we denote that kind of inter interpersonal uh, conflict. Listen, thank you so much. We're almost out of time. We've got through a lot of questions. I'm sorry, there's a lot of questions that we haven't got through, um, but you do have um, Renata's details um, and we'll put them up in the uh, chat function again just so you've got them for reference. Um, we've covered a lot of ground as we always do in our webinars. Uh, Claire, what, you know, having listened to Renata, having listened to the discussion and been part of the discussion, what, what, what has sort of struck you as a sort of take home message? Take home message, um, I think, I suppose what we've heard again and again and again, if we're seeing these odd, unhappy behaviours with our horses, um, please speak to your vet. Let's just, just be absolutely confident that pain is not the issue. And then from there, there's all sorts of resources that can help make our horses so much happier. Brilliant. Perth, thank you. Renata? So for me, I will take a slightly different tack to Claire, because for me, I think we, um, well, we need to be aware of the fact that pain and fear and poor welfare are important causes of aggression. Aggression in and of itself is not an abnormal behavior, and we shouldn't be afraid of aggression. And we should also understand that our horses have, you know, they're entitled to express how they feel. And we should respect that and listen to them uh, and respect the the subtle signals because that's the polite thing to do and it's also the safe thing to do that is grand um and i have to say that that you know the the, the thoughts that, that cross my mind having listened to both, both of you is the fact that aggression is a method of communication and that 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 ladder of aggression you showed from the green and, and actually just trying to identify that earlier and I, I love the way you put it renata the purpose of the aggression and then the cause of the aggression. And I thought that 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 was really the fact that you rode a coach and horses through the fact that dominance and aggression are not related. I love that. And the, the, just the practical um, help of diary writing. There's so much actually in our equine care and management, um, uh, whether it's the end of life management, but in this regard about, you know, De de dealing with if you do have an aggressive horse how important diary writing is i thought that was a really helpful and and, and, and practical tip so listen um remember if you've got a topic uh that you would like uh, us to cover in a future webinar then do email us on education at worldhorsewelfare.org remember to sign up uh for our webinar in two weeks time with dr Gemma pearson and eileen gillen um, and we will be looking at the principle of equine of, of training horses based on equine learning theory um, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. It's been brilliant and for all your questions. And obviously a huge thank you to Claire and to you, Renata. That was that was amazing. And the comments coming through uh, uh, would absolutely echo that. Brilliant, wonderful, excellent, fascinating, and every other term we could think of. So thank you so much for that to, to Claire and Renata. You've been brilliant. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks time with Gemma and Eileen on equine learning theory and, and the role that plays in training of our horses. Have a great uh, couple of weeks. See you then.